Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome back for those that were here last week. Welcome to those that weren't here last week. In our winter semester, the catalogs are first being designed and printed. You'll be getting it in the mail in a few weeks. Um, I'm going to be doing two different series. One series will be on the subject called The Chosen People. What exactly does that mean? Is it an arrogant statement? What are we chosen for? How does one behave chosen? How are we supposed to feel that we're chosen? And we'll do a three-part series just on the concept of the chosen people. And then I'm going to be doing another four-part series. It's a little bit of a, a dangerous one, but I'm going to give it a shot. The course is called Elections 2012. Now, let me tell you what it's not. It's not a political course, and it's not going to be for either myself or the audience to get up and say who to vote for. We'd love to do that, but not here. It will be selecting some of the issues that are being discussed during the election campaign and not looking at it from the perspective of the Democratic Party, Republican, conservative, or liberal, but trying to take these same issues, rewind the clock 2,000 years, and see what the Talmud said on these issues thousands of years ago. So showing that issues that are first being discussed today are actually part of Judaic teachings of thousands of years ago. Uh, and we're going to dissect some of the issues, some of that which is uh, taking place in the news, redistribution of wealth, immigration questions, um, taxation issues, loophole issues. And we're going to try to dissect them by looking again. We're not going to get into the heat of the campaign, but we're going to steal the issues that are being talked about in the news, and we're going to try to see it from a Judaic Talmudic perspective. So that's coming up. In our winter semester, two different courses that I'll, I will be leading myself to uh, help you join us. So, Sam Goldstein, I think we spoke about him in the past. Uh, this time he was a magician, and he worked on a cruise ship. And the audience was different each week. You know, the cruise ships, they leave on a Sunday, come back on a Sunday, so every week it's a whole new audience, which is very good for the entertainers because they can do the same routines every single week and it's a different audience so they can do the same jokes and this particular magician is doing the same tricks over and over again there was only one problem the captain had a parrot and this parrot saw the show each and every single week and began to understand how the magician did every trick and once the parrot figured it out, the parrot started shouting it out to the audience. It's not the same hat. He's hiding the flowers under the table. All the cards are the ace of spades. And the magician was furious. But the magician also knew he couldn't do anything about it. After all, it was the captain's parrot. He's got to behave himself. One stormy night in the Pacific... Bad storm. The ship unfortunately sank, drowning almost all who were on board. But Sam Goldstein, the magician, luckily found himself on a piece of wood floating in the middle of the sea. And as fate would have it, the parrot survived as well. And the parrot's on the other end of this plank of wood floating in the sea. They stared at each other with hatred, but they didn't say a word. A day goes by, just staring at each other with dirty looks, not a word. Two days, three days, finally, on the fourth day, the parrot couldn't hold back any longer and said, Okay, I give up. Where's the ship? And the rest of our evening is going to be far more serious than that. Back in the 1700s, in the days of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, a holy, mystical, tzaddik, holy man, someone in the community was deathly ill. 
the family came running to the Baal Shem Tov and said, Rebbe, please do something, say something, do a prayer, we need a miracle here. The Baal Shem Tov asked that a special wax candle be prepared. He took this wax candle and he went out to a place in the forest. He found a particular tree, lit the candle, and put the candle in the tree. He then invoked some special prayers, and through these mystical meditations and these phrases that he was saying, sure enough the blessings came, and the person had a miraculous recovery. Years later, a similar incident took place, but not with the Baal Shem Tov, it's the next generation, the Baal Shem Tov's successor, the Magid of Mizrich. And again, a life was hanging in the balance. And the family came to the Magid and they said, we've heard that the Baal Shem Tov once was able to perform this miracle and bring about refuah, bring about healing to this individual that was near death. We need that same type of Baal Shem Tov miracle. And we're coming to you, you're the successor. So the Magid went to the same forest, to the same tree. He had the candle, and he said, The prayers that the Baal Shem Tov said one generation ago, I do not know. I don't know what he said. But here's the forest, here's the tree, here's the candle. May the merit of my master help bring about the blessing. In honor of the Baal Shem Tov, whatever you said a generation ago, I hope that merit still stands. And refua and healing come. And indeed the blessing came. A generation later, another crisis, matter of life and death, miracle was needed this time. The Hasid, the Hasidic Rebbe was Rab Moshe Leib of Sasiv. And Rav Moshe Leib was approached and they said, we know that the times of the Magid, he was able to perform a miracle. And we know that the Rebbe before the times of the Baal Shem Tov, he was able to perform a miracle. So we come to you now. Please pray to God Almighty for a miracle. Rav Moshe Leib said, the prayers that the Baal Shem Tov recited, I do not know. Where that special tree is. I do not know. What type of candle he lit? I do not know. I don't even know which forest he went to. All I know is the story. So I will simply tell over the story of how the Baal Shem Tov brought about healing. And with that, may the blessings come. More emblematic of Jews and Judaism than most anything else are our stories. We have a fascination, perhaps an obsession, with stories. We tell them like nobody else. Why do you think we are so prominently involved in the movie and TV industry? Because it's about telling a story. Storytelling is our specialty, and it's always been our specialty. It's part of our genetic makeup. Indeed, every aspect of our lives is animated, informed, and enriched by stories. The five books of Moses. Yes, it's a book of teachings, and it's a book of law, but it's told to us through the medium of stories. The Medrash, the Talmud, tales of the Baal Shem Tov, Hasidic stories through the generations. From the golden years of Spain, the years of the Inquisition, years of European Jewry, even the dark years of the Holocaust, modern day Israel, to the blossoming of Judaism in America. Stories. Millions and millions of stories. Every Jewish holiday, what is a Jewish holiday? Passover and Sukkot and Purim and Hanukkah. What do we do aside for the traditions associated of lighting the menorah and giving the Mishloach Manot? What do we do on these holidays? We get together with family members and we tell the story. 
Laman to Saper Bosne Bincha. Make sure you pass these stories on to your children so that your children will pass it on to their children. Tell the story. All throughout the Torah, God is telling us, tell the story. You see, a good Jewish story is not just there to amuse or to entertain. A good Jewish story is rich with symbolism and meaning. It's meant to be instructive and inspiring. The Bible is not telling us stories just because it wants to give us bedtime stories. It tells us stories because it wants us to learn from the story itself. A Jewish story can break through the barriers that sometimes prayer cannot. A good Jewish story can build bridges across oceans, across time and space. Someone once said a storyteller, like a travel agent, can gather us from wherever we are and put us down in another setting. Like a heavenly chariot, a good Jewish story transports, transports us to new places of wisdom, of wonder. And so my friends, in the course of tonight's talk, I hope to take you on a journey. A journey aboard such a chariot. But at the same time, I hope that all of us together will be able to take from these stories and reach for a higher dimension as to what a Jewish story can be, where the story itself comes to life. The story comes to life not in 2D or 3D, but in real time. Rabbi Moshe Leib couldn't find the forest, and he didn't know the Kabbalistic formula, but by telling the story, he recreated the spiritual power, the spiritual energy of that event. And that is the ultimate of a Jewish story. And perhaps if we tune into some of these stories, we can relive some of the energy of these stories as they happened the original time and have them have an effect on our lives in a positive way. People often ask me, why do you tell so many stories? Every sermon, every lecture, every class, you start with a story, you end with a story, you ask a question with a story, you answer with a story. What's with all the stories? So I said to them, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> no, seriously, I find that stories can often convey deep concepts and ideas far more clearly and more profoundly than straight oratory. Stories that are not just stories, but as I call it, whispers of the soul. When you hear a particular story, sometimes your neshama, your soul, feels such a connection to it. And you begin to hear the whispers of your soul communicating to you through the story. And the thing is, you never know where the next, the next great Jewish story might be born. They could be born right here on the streets of Agora Hills or Westlake Village or Thousand Oaks or Calabasas. There are new Jewish stories unfolding all around us all the time. But of course, nowhere are greater Jewish stories born than on the streets of Jerusalem. The very stones of Jerusalem have a story to tell. Every brick, every stone that's there can tell thousands of stories. Those of you who have visited the Kotel, the Western Wall, may have noticed this elderly man wearing a guard's uniform who walks around looking after things. He organizes, he cleans up, he removes the notes from the walls when they're overflowing. That's his job. And recently someone got around to talking to this man, and sure enough, he had a story to share. His name is Binyamin Wurzberger. Binyamin was originally from Hungary. As a teenager, he was sent to the camps, where he was forced to drag heavy railroad ties and lay tracks for the Germans. When it came time to eat, he would have just a few minutes to grab whatever scraps they would throw at him, if any at all. But for all the horrors, there was one memory that always stayed with him. Every day, while standing in line for his scraps of food, there was a Nazi commander who would stand there and taunt him. Do you dream of getting to Jerusalem? 
I bet you do. You Jews are always dreaming about Jerusalem. And then he would say with this sadistic laugh, it's possible, you know, maybe your ashes will blow through those chimneys and fly to Jerusalem. Your ashes, your ashes will get there, but you never will. And so Benjamin Wurzberger relates, I was beaten, I was humiliated, I was starved, and I was worked literally to the bone. In later years, I was sent on one of those horrible death marches which only a handful survived. But every day, every day I would think of those Nazis' words, and I would will myself to keep going so that one day I would be able to show him and his ilk that I made it. That I made it to Jerusalem. Not my ashes. I made it. I was the only member of my family to survive the Holocaust and after many journeys I made it to Israel. I got married. I raised a beautiful family. And just recently when I retired from my job my wife and children thought that I would stay home and I would relax. But I had one more mission in life. I walked into the offices of the Western Wall Heritage Foundation the organization that maintains and renovates the area of the Kotel of the Western Mall, and I announced, I would like to work for you. The manager looked at me and said, excuse me, you're an elderly man, and we're not exactly hiring right now. And I said to him, no, you don't understand. I'll do anything you ask, and I don't want to be paid a penny. This is volunteer work. Just please, let me work here. You won't be disappointed. And so Benjamin Wurzberger was given the task of cleaning the stones of the Kotel of the Western Wall. He wakes up at 5 a.m. every day to begin this labor of love. And he says, I never look at the watch when I'm at work. When I stand near the holy stones, I hear the words of that Nazi officer. And I look at the thousands of my Jewish brothers and sisters proudly praying at the wall. And I smile. For this I live. For this I live. You see, compelling Jewish stories are not just those of years gone by. In our own times we find seemingly ordinary people doing extraordinary things, teaching us extraordinary lessons about the sanctity and the preciousness of of life. Now just recently in the news we heard about another tragic shooting taking place at Virginia Tech. Perhaps you remember the story of the Romanian born professor, Dr. Liviu Librescu, a Holocaust survivor who lived in Israel. He took a teaching post at Virginia Tech University and on that fateful day of April 16, 2007, He was teaching his class in solid mechanics when a crazed killer entered the Norris Hall engineering building and began opening fire in the classrooms. 76-year-old Nebrescu held the door of room 204 shut while the killer kept trying to force it open. Even after being shot through the door, Dr. Nebrescu stood his ground and managed to hold the gunman off long enough so that 22 out of his 23 students managed to escape through the window. Dr. Lebrescu was struck by five bullets. The last one was a shot to his head, which proved fatal. What is it? What is it that can enable a human being of flesh and blood, 76 years of age, to stand there and to hold a door, to take bullets, to surrender his life to save others. You think about this. Survival is the most basic of human and animal instincts. An instinct which dictates that in such a situation you run. Instinct takes over at a time like this. You do what it takes to survive. Self-preservation. This man survived the Nazis. He survived the communists to be murdered by a deranged monster 
in Blacksburg, Virginia. What is it that enables a man to do such a thing? The answer is that in addition to a physical body, a human being has a spiritual soul, a godly soul. And if you are in touch with that godly soul, then when faced with the ultimate of challenges, instead of resorting to your basic human instincts, you rise to the divine instincts within you, which is to look beyond yourself to help another. So here you had one door, two sides of the same one door, a snapshot of two extremes of the human condition. On one side, a human being that became higher than an angel, and on the other side, a human being that was lower than an animal. That's what people took from the story the selflessness and the heroism of a person who took five bullets to save his students. In the days after the massacre, thousands of people all over the world undertook to perform acts of goodness and kindness in Dr. Labrescu's honor. And then President Bush remarked two days later at a memorial service, on the day of remembrance, this Holocaust survivor gave his own life so that others may live. And this morning we honor his memory and we take strength from his example. You see, not all Jewish stories are happy stories. Like life itself, some are happy, some are sad, and some have a combination of both. Some stories tell us about pain, pain that for now cannot be cured, but only endured. There's a pediatric anesthesiologist who tells of how he was working with an 11-year-old boy who had a continually recurring cancer. Rahman al-Islam, we should never know of such things. And the treatments were very painful. But in this boy's case, the doctor was able to mitigate the pain with various anesthetics. One day, this boy Brian caught a cold. He still had to have the cancer treatment, but the doctor was not able to give him the anesthesia because of the cold, it could be extremely dangerous. So the doctor sat the boy down and with his heart breaking he said, Brian, I love you very much and I have to give you this treatment but I can't give you the anesthesia this time. I can't take away the pain. But every time that I will apply the treatment I'm going to hold you I'm going to hold you through this whole thing. And each time the pain comes, I'm going to be there and I'm going to hold you tighter and tighter. And you'll feel better. It's a simple story. But it shows what you can do when you can't do anything. There are times where there's nothing you can do to stop the pain. And life is like that. Nobody can have all the pain taken away. There are times when there's nothing to do but say to someone, even if I can't take it away, I can give you a hug, I can hold you, I can be there for you when the pain is there. When the pain cannot be cured, only endured. That's when our Jewish stories remind us that we have a Father in Heaven who's a loving pediatrician who holds us tightly and comforts us when we're hurting. And so I'm going to share a few stories that may be difficult to tell and perhaps difficult to hear. Nevertheless, I think they should be told, perhaps must be told, because at the end of the day, these are authentic Jewish stories. These are the whispers of the soul. One of the great teachers of Torah after the Holocaust was a Rosh Yeshiva headmaster named Rabbi Yisrael Zev Gustman. He headed up a yeshiva in Jerusalem. And in addition to delivering lectures to his students, Rabbi Gustman used to give weekly lectures to lay people. Many of them lawyers, scientists, judges, academians. One of the regular attendees was Professor Robert Uman. If you're familiar with that name, it's because you follow the Nobel Prizes. And in 2005, Professor Uman won the Nobel Prize in Economics. 
But this goes before 2005. This is June of 1982. Professor Oman's son, Shlomo, a young father whose wife was expecting their second child, was called to duty during the first war in Lebanon. And tragically, Shlomo was killed in action before his second child was born. Rabbi Gustman and all the students of the yeshiva attended the funeral. And after the burial, the elderly Rabbi Gustman walked among the grave sites of other Israeli soldiers killed in combat, his face twisted in anguish. They are all so holy, he cried, so holy, every single one of them, so very holy. On his way home, Rabbi Gustman asked that he be taken to the home where the omens were sitting shiva. He came in and he sat down next to the grieving father. And after a while, Professor Uman looked up and said, Rabbi, I appreciate the fact that you came to the cemetery today for the funeral. And I know you have a schedule to keep back at the yeshiva, so it's okay you don't have to stay here that long. It's okay you can go back. Rav Guzman thought for a moment, and he asked if he can speak. He said, I don't know if any of you know this, but I had a son. His name was Mayer. Mayer was a beautiful child. The Nazis broke down our door of our home. They grabbed Mayer from my arms and they shot him right in front of me in cold blood. I was able to escape. And later I bartered Mayer's shoes for food. It was the last thing of his that I had in my possession. But I was starving. So I bartered it away for a little bit of food. And then I couldn't bring myself to eat that food. And I gave the food away to other starving people. My mayor, he says at the Shiva house, was a holy soul. He and all the six million who perished and the one and a half million who perished are Kedoshim, holy souls. He says, you know something? There hasn't been a day in my life that I haven't had nightmares of seeing his shoes. Every time I close my eyes, every time I sleep, that's all I can see. My mayor's shoes. I could never get those shoes out of my mind. I want you to know, he tells Professor Oman, what I think is going on right now in the heavenly world. My son, Mayor, is welcoming your son, Shlomo, into this congregation, into the minion, the congregation in the heavenly world. And my son is saying to your son, I died because I was a Jew. But I was never able to save anybody else. But you, Shlomo, you died defending your fellow Jews. My mayor is a member of this holy congregation, but your Shlomo, he says to Professor Oman, he's the leader of the congregation. He's the representative, he's the advocate of the Jewish people, in whose defense he gave his life. He tells the professor, I never had the opportunity to sit shiva for my mayor. So if it's okay with you, can I sit here with you now as you sit shiva for your son so that I sit shiva for my son? And maybe, maybe tonight, I'll stop seeing the shoes. Professor Oman looked up at Rabbi Gusman and said with tears in his eyes, I thought I could never find comfort in anyone's words. But Rebbe, you have given me comfort. That's a Jewish story. Stories that can heal us when we're wounded. Stories that can make us whole when we're broken. Stories that can give us perspective and strength to cope with the dissonance and conflicts in our lives. That's what a Jewish story has a power to do. 
Each and every one of us have our own Jewish story. Many stories that are deeply personal and speak to us directly. Stories that send us a message that if, if we tuned in, we know how to recognize them as a story of our soul. But we need to tune into them. We need to listen to the message. Before the Baal Shem Tov passed away, he charged each of his disciples with an individual mission. He gave each one a job that he wanted them to carry out after his passing. And to one of them he said, your mission is to go out there in the world and tell stories. Tell people the stories that you saw during the years you were together with me. It wasn't exactly the career he was hoping to get. Didn't sound exactly like one that was going to bring him wealth to be a storyteller. So he asks the Baal Shem Tov, how many years do you want me to do this for? Is this a lifetime sentence or is it a five year term? Is it a ten year term? How long? So the Baal Shem Tov says, you'll know. You'll know when the time has come that you can stop. You'll know yourself. And so indeed, after the Baal Shem Tov passed away, this particular chassid would go from town to town, from city to city, telling over the incredible stories of the Baal Shem Tov. This went on for year after year after year. One day this chassid was told that there was a wealthy nobleman living near the Polish border who put out word that he's willing to pay handsomely to anyone that could visit him and tell him stories about the Baal Shem Tov. Perfect! Wow! Someone that's looking for someone that's doing what I'm doing, that's willing to pay, this is great! But it was far, far away. He would have to travel for months. But perhaps he would be paid enough. And it would make it worth his while. He makes the journey, he arrives at the mansion, he knocks on the door, he tells the doorkeeper, I'm a former disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, and I have been told that the master of this house is interested in hearing stories about the Baal Shem Tov. The butler said, yeah, indeed I know he is. I'll, I'll get, go get him right away. The master of the house comes and he sees this chassid there, and the chassid says, I've heard that you uh, want to hear stories of the Baal Shem Tov. Yes, indeed, it's true. He says, well... The Baal Shem Tov, in fact, asked me to be a storyteller. That's wonderful. That's great. I'd like to invite you to spend time in my house. It's almost Shabbos. It was a Thursday of his arrival. I'm going to throw a big Friday night dinner for the whole community to come together. And you're going to get up and you're going to tell stories at this Friday night dinner. We'll do the same thing for Shabbos lunch. And then after Shabbos, we'll do a Malava Malka. And then we'll do a Sunday breakfast. We'll just keep having the community come together to hear stories from our guest. The caterer is notified. The chicken and the chicken soup are on its way. Invitations are out. And indeed, the place is mob packed. Everyone from the community is there. And our storyteller, Chassid, gets up to tell a story. And suddenly... His mind goes blank. As if he has amnesia. He can't remember a single story. His entire career has been telling stories and suddenly he's blank. The host thought perhaps he was shy. Maybe he was tired from all the traveling. So he comes to his defense and he says, You know what, tonight let's just enjoy the meal. Tomorrow for lunch we're going to hear the stories. Everyone is back the next day. Our storyteller gets up. And once again, blank. Nothing doing. The same happens Saturday night, the same Sunday. They wait till Monday, nothing doing. He can't remember a single story. And so it went on day in and day out. Until the chassid went to the nobleman and he said, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I'm not a fraud. I wasn't trying to steal from you. I really am a storyteller, and every time I get up to tell a story, my mind goes blank. The nobleman said, it's not your fault. I believe you, it's not your fault. I'd like to pay you for your time anyway. How can I accept money from you? I didn't deliver anything. No, you have to. You meant well. I understand. I totally understand. And he paid him. 
the chassid gets into his horse and buggy about to go away, and at that moment, he remembers but just one story. One story. He darts back and he tells the nobleman, listen, stop invitations and matzo ball soups and chicken. I, I remember a story. Let me tell it to you right now, before I forget it. He says, go ahead and tell me the story. He says, it's a short story. It's a little story. That's all I remember. Go ahead, tell me. He said, I remember that a man once came to see the Baal Shem Tov. He was very upset. He said, Rabbi, I used to be a good God-fearing Jew. But you know, the temptations of the outside world beckoned. I felt that my Jewish identity was depriving me of the pleasures of the world, so I converted out of my faith. And I became very rich and very successful, but not only did I abandon my religion, I did many things to hurt my people. I guess as a way of suppressing my guilt, I would seek any opportunity to conspire against the Jews, to be part of plots that would take place in the community against the Jews. Recent events, however, have led me to realize how wrong my behavior has been. And I'm here to beg forgiveness. I'm here to find my way back. I have wealth and possessions galore, but my soul is broken, so very broken, what can I do? And the Baal Shem Tov then proceeded to tell this man different things he can do to help his people, and thereby redeem himself, and repent from his past ways, to turn it around and use his knowledge and his good fortune to help for good. But the man cried to the Baal Shem Tov and he said, Well, how will I ever know, how will I ever know? that God has indeed forgiven me. To which the Baal Shem Tov said, you'll know you were forgiven when someone one day comes and tells you this story. As he finished saying these words, the nobleman who was crying away embraced him and said, you don't remember me? I was that man. And I've been waiting for decades and decades to hear this story so that I know that up on high, I have been forgiven. And when you came, I recognized you right away because you were with the group that was with the Baal Shem Tov the day that I came. And I knew this was the moment, so I wanted the whole community to be there as part of this festivity. And then when you forgot, I thought it meant that I was not forgiven. I tried the next day and the next day, and my repentance intensified, my prayers intensified, my chariot intensified until this very moment. Thank you. Thank you for restoring my soul. And two Jews meet and share a story. You never know. You never know if that story is one that your soul has been waiting and craving to hear for so long. And now that you've heard it, perhaps your life will never be the same again. Because that story is your story. That story is God's way of tapping you on your shoulders and saying, there's something I need you to do. I gave you special talents. I gave you gifts so that you can go forth and paint your masterpiece and shine your light. There's a woman named Mrs. Bracha Kapach. She's a Yemenite woman. She immigrated to Israel with her family in 1943. She was walking on a street in Jerusalem years ago when she found an old woman lying on the ground. The woman was starving. She took the woman inside and she fed her. She was so shaken by how close this woman had come to dying that she started a soup kitchen to provide food and clothing for impoverished families. Today, Bracha Kapach feeds 1,400 families on a daily basis. She responded to her story, and she painted her masterpiece. In 1990, Dr. Rick Hodes traveled to Africa for six weeks to provide medical assistance for the 25,000 Jews heading off to Israel. After 20 years, after adopting now five Ethiopian children and treating 50,000 patients, he's still in Ethiopia, providing medical attention to those with nowhere else to turn. He's painting a masterpiece with his life. 
When Renee Overton was a child of 11 or 12 years old, she would go with her mother to visit her grandmother at a nursing home. While there, she would see the malaise and despair which so many of the other patients were languishing. Seniors in the golden years of their lives, doing nothing with their time, alone, lonely, nobody visiting, nobody bringing them anything, nobody saying a word to them. And it broke her heart so much that she would go from room to room bringing food baskets and good cheer to the residents, becoming the de facto granddaughter to so many of these Bubbies and Zabies. Years later, right here in our community, Renee founded the Evelyn Overton Sunshine Club that provides visitation and special programs for seniors throughout the Caneo Valley. She's painting a masterpiece. She's making her story our story. So the question is, how do you respond to the stories of your life? Are the stories of your life like movies that last for a couple of hours and then just fade into the memory as the credits roll? Or do you see within your stories profound messages and opportunities to go out there and paint your masterpiece? Let's understand, not all of us are inspired or compelled to create masterpieces on large scales. Nor do we have to. Our daily lives can become masterpieces. We each have our own places, our own situations where we can shine. Where we can make a difference, where we can have an impact. The key is to perk up when you hear your story and respond by writing one of your own. Life is not only about the big and it's not only about the impressive. It's not only about the great moments of inspiration and motivation that hit us during certain times. On the high holidays we get inspired or we're faced with tumultuous events. Suddenly something turns on. Life is about what happens to us every single day. On a regular Monday. In the words of motivational speaker Zig Ziglar, he said, when people say, what's the point of getting all inspired and motivated? Motivation doesn't last. I say, bathing doesn't either. That's why I recommend it daily. Every day should have within it new sources of inspiration and motivation. Every day of life is precious. And I hate to be the one to break it to you folks, but we don't have an unlimited supply of them. There's only so much time we have on this planet to write our stories, to create our masterpieces. Do you know what the number one fear in people's lives are? You know what the, if people were asked what your greatest fear is. Now I know for me it would be snakes. But you know what the poll came in at? Number one, public speaking. Public speaking was number one. You know what number two is? Fear of death. Public speaking, number one. Fear of death, number two. So when you think about it, this means the average person that goes to a funeral would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. <laughs> They're afraid more of standing at a microphone than being in the casket. There's something, something wrong with this. But there are people that give a lot of thought to what might be said about them at their eulogies. Or what should be written, or what they would like to have written on their tombstones. Somebody once told me that recently he was in a Jewish cemetery and he saw an entire section of tombstones that were engraved with a symbol of a bowling ball. Every tombstone in the section had a bowling ball. And they were all inscribed, We lived to bowl. Apparently these folks belong to a league and they didn't want posterity to lose sight of we live to bowl. They enjoyed their night bowling. But my point is perhaps we should focus less on eulogies and tombstones but on, rather on the stories that we're telling now. Not what story will be told about me after 120 years. What story do I have to tell today? In order to create good stories, however, we need to have worthy goals. What's the goal? 
of most working Americans today to retire early. We want to retire now at 55, that's the goal. Okay, good. So let's say you can retire at 55, then what? What are you going to do with yourself for the next 40, 50 years? How many times can you read the newspaper? No, everybody reads the newspapers anymore. You got Google. You find out the news instantaneously. So what, how many times are you going to go on Google every single day? Are you going to find out new recipes for blintzes a hundred times? Ah, so what are you going to do? You'll retire so that you can play golf. Golf, golf has become the newest religion. Look, you're not going to become the next Tiger Woods. If people went to shul as religiously as they played golf, Moshiach would come. Could you imagine if every Jew, not telling them to give up golf, I'm telling them for every time you play golf, you go to shul one time. Can you imagine how many shuls we would need in the world? It would be magnificent. Sam Goldstein's back. Sam Goldstein and his friend Gus, they're playing golf one day at their local golf course. Sam is about to chip onto the green when he sees a long funeral procession on the road next to the course. He stops in mid-swing. He bows his head, he closes his eyes in prayer. Gus says, wow, Sam, that was one of the most thoughtful and touching things I've ever seen, that you stopped and did that. You're such a kind and sensitive man. Then again, we were married for 35 years. <laughs> it's the least I can do. <laughs> Sam and Gus met in the clubhouse one day, and Gus says to Sam, I hear you had a tragedy while you were golfing last week. Sam says, yeah, it was terrible. I was playing the twosome with Harry, and at the ninth hole, Harry had a heart attack, and he dropped dead right there on the spot. Gus says, yeah, I heard, and someone told me that you yourself carried him all the way back to the clubhouse. That must have been tough. Harry weighs over 200 pounds. Sam says, well, the carrying part, that wasn't so hard. It was putting him down for every stroke and picking him back up every time. That was the killer. So Baruch Hashem, there are certain rituals that we're very religiously committed to. But if that's what retirement and the goal is all about, I can tell you that Yiddishkeit Judaism is not very big on retirement. Judaism says as long as there's a breath of life in you, there's something you can do to make a difference. If you retired from your job, it doesn't mean you're retired. It just means you're entering another phase in your life. But there's still so much more you can accomplish. There's still a masterpiece that you can paint. There's still a story that you can tell, like the elderly Jew at the Kotel. Perhaps even the most important chapter of all. So my friends, what kind of stories are we writing? What kind of stories can be told about us? Whatever those may be, I assure you it's not too late to start writing some new ones. And some really good ones doesn't have to be earth shattering or mountain moving to make a good story. You don't have to cure cancer or paint the Mona Lisa to create your own masterpiece in life. I'll give you a very simple suggestion. Take time to visit somebody. Carve out some time in your weekly schedule. If someone's in the hospital, visit them. We've made it easy for you. We've given you an opportunity. There's a brochure on your desk for the Sunshine Club. It allows you to sign up to volunteer and we'll peer you up with a senior citizen in your community that you can befriend. And you can visit once a week, once in two weeks. They may be in a senior home, they may be living at home. Just become someone's friend. Paint your masterpiece. After the lecture tonight, Malka and Mushka, who are our coordinators, they'll tell you more about it if you'd like. They'll take your registration form. Paint your masterpiece. Make this part of your life. Now it can be raising your children. Not always headline grabbing stuff. Not too much fanfare there. But if you raise them with good values and healthy priorities and a strong sense of identity 
If you raise mention, real mention, that's a masterpiece too. Not so easy to raise children, especially teenagers. But at all ages, they're difficult. In the story, this woman was in a supermarket, and our three-year-old girl begins to act up. You know those fits that are reserved for supermarkets? They get very, very loud, very quick. It's usually because they spotted something in one of the aisles that they wanted, and the mommy said, no, you can't have it. That sets off a siren. It's like a siren, because the kid knows that if I can make mom so uncomfortable, I'll get what I want. 99% of the time it works, because they really know how to belt it out at particular places. And this three-year-old is screeching and screaming. Everybody in the market is hearing this little girl scream. But they're also noticing how calm the mother is. Mother says, Sarah, don't cry. Very soon you'll be home and everything will be fine. The kid's screaming away. Sarah, please don't cry. In a few minutes you'll be in the car on the way home. All will be good. Shoppers are beginning to take notice, beginning to watch the crowd. The crying is getting louder and louder, more animated. She doesn't give in. Sarah, don't cry. Soon we'll be done. You'll be home. Maybe you'll even take a nap. But finally, one shopper comes over and says, I gotta tell you, I am so impressed. You're so calm. You're talking to your little Sarah there so calmly. The mother looks at her and says, No. I'm Sarah. She's Rachel. <laughs> so, it, mothers know exactly what I'm talking about. So, raising children is as artful of a masterpiece as any. But take any mitzvah, any good deed where you can shine. Whether it's getting involved with your synagogue. Whether it's putting on film we spoke last week or lighting the Shabbos candles, volunteering time for children with special needs, serving as a mentor for troubled teenagers, whatever it is that you can do, paint your masterpiece and paint it beautifully. Pick your mitzvah. Pick your deed. You got a lot of them out there. You got 613 to choose from. Pick something. Make it yours. Do it with passion. Stories that will build bridges between you and your fellows. Stories that will create bonds between one generation and the next. Between those of this world and those of the world beyond. That's the type of story you need to start writing in your own lives. The first Israeli soldier that was killed in the 2008 Gaza war was a young man by the name of Dvir Aminalov. Needless to say, his mother, Dahlia, was completely shattered. She missed her dvir terribly. One night before she went to bed, she said in a loud voice, God, please give me a sign. A sign that dvir is okay. Give me a hug from dvir so that I'll know that his death had some meaning. Send some communication, some message to me from up above so I can get through these difficult times. That week, Dahlia's daughter asked her to accompany her to a musical performance at the International Crafts Festival in Jerusalem. Feeling quite despondent, Dahlia had no interest or desire to go to a concert, but she didn't want to disappoint her daughter as well, who was also coping with the loss of her brother. And so she agreed to go. As it turns out, the concert was a bit delayed. It was an Israeli show after all. And they're waiting for the program to start. This three-year-old precocious little boy begins wandering around restlessly through the stands. And he walks up to where Dahlia is sitting and he starts tap tapping her on the shoulder. Now Dahlia was a preschool teacher, so she turned around, saw this boy. She smiled. She said, what's your name? He said, my name is Eshel. That's such a nice name. Do you want to be my friend, Eshel? And she begins this communication with this three-year-old. And the boy is nodding, the boy is smiling, the boy finds a new friend. And Eshel's parents were sitting just about two, three rows up. And they were concerned that the little one was bothering this, this woman. So they kept on telling him, come back here, come back here. But he had a new friend, he wasn't interested in coming back. 
as little children tend to do, this three-year-old Eshel suddenly piped up with a statement. And she, he says to this woman, Dahlia, I have a baby. You want to see my baby? His name is Dvir. And you can imagine the moment she hears the name Dvir, she freezes up. You want to see my baby? And Dahlia says, sure. And this little Eshel is pulling Dahlia up two, three rows to see this very cute little baby. And Dahlia asks Eshel's mom, why did you choose the name Dvir? So the baby's mother said, because he was born right after the war in Gaza. And she began to explain when she was at the end of her pregnancy, the doctor suspected the fetus may have some very serious birth defect. And since it was the end of the pregnancy, there was little that the doctors can do, and they just had to wait and see how things would turn out. She said, when I got home that night, the news reported the first casualty in the war in Gaza was a soldier named Devere. I was so saddened by the news that I decided to make a deal with God. And I said, God, give me a healthy son. I promise you I'll name him Dvir after that brave soldier that died tonight. Dahlia, the mother of Dvir, stood with her mouth open. She tried to speak, but she couldn't. And after a long silence, she said, I'm Dvir's mother. My name is Dahlia Minalov. The sudden inspiration, baby Dvir's mother handed Dahlia the baby and said, Dvir would like to give you a hug. Dahlia held this little baby boy in her arms, looked into his angelic face. The emotion she felt at that moment was overwhelming. She had asked God for a hug from Dvir, and she got a hug from Dvir. Sometimes our stories tell of pain that cannot be cured, only endured. But know this, my friends, our stories, they're not static. They're dynamic. They're all chapters in a huge epic that is bigger than what we see in the glance of a year or a decade or even a lifetime. The story continues. So even when we tell a sad story, no, it doesn't end there. There are things that we don't see. Things perhaps we didn't see from generations earlier. Things perhaps we won't see for generations to come. Some of you may have heard about this list. It comes out once a year. 50 most influential rabbis in America. You've heard about this list? I'm not on it. No. The past few years, the rabbi that has voted the most prominent an influential rabbi in America. Past few years, the same rabbi is number one. It was Rabbi Yehuda Krinsky, chairman of the Central Organizing Committee of Chabad headquarters in New York. Now, when I first heard this, I, I found it rather curious. Not, not jealous, just curious. Rabbi Krinsky? Hmm. See, Rabbi Krinsky has no congregation. He doesn't give sermons, doesn't really lecture, doesn't give classes. What does it mean most influential rabbi in America? He runs an organization, but he's not out there teaching. He's not inspiring others because he doesn't speak in front of communities. Now, no knock on Rabbi Krinsky. I'm a very close friend of Rabbi Krinsky. But I was curious. And then I realized it has nothing to do with Rabbi Krinsky. It's about the man for whom Rabbi Krinsky served as secretary for 40 years. You see, for 40 years, Rabbi Krinsky was the secretary to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who physically may have passed away 17 years ago, but continues to have the greatest influence and impact on world Jewry today. So where they could not say the most influential rabbi in America is a rabbi that's no longer alive, 
What did they do? They picked his secretary and they put his name up there every single year, even though he never teaches. So in a respectful manner, what they're really trying to say is, the Lubavitcher Rebbe still to today is influencing and inspiring more people than any other rabbi. And you see, this is the spirit and vitality of the Jewish story. When your story is that powerful, you can be physically absent for 17 years and still be the most present person on earth. It's a phenomenon as old as Judaism itself. Let me try it this way. What's the most famous song in Judaism? David, Melech Yisrael. What's the next words? What does that mean? Chai, chai, v'kaya. He lives and he endures. What does it mean, King David lives? There's a King David burial. There's a King David memorial. We read where King David died, how he died, how old he was when he died. There are monuments to him. What does it mean? We sing, Chai, Chai, V'kayim. We have our children sing, David, Malach, Yisrael, Chai, V'kayim. Because the stories of King David lives on. Because the masterpieces of King David live on. And therefore he lives on. The Baal Shem Tov said, our stories have a way of removing the barriers between heaven and earth. The stories allow those who are in heaven to still be with us here on earth. I'm going to share a very personal story with you. I've only shared this one other time. And I'm going to actually shut the recorder here, sorry. Each and every day we pray for a time when we'll finally be able to learn the rest of the stories and put it all into proper context so that we finally have more answers than questions. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we must hear the stories, we must share the stories for they are the lifelines to our essence. We must sit with our children and with our grandchildren and tell them the stories, the stories of their heritage, the stories of their ancestors, but not just tell it to them. We have to tell it to them with passion, tell it to them with excitement, tell it to them with enthusiasm. Bring it alive. Make the story your story. Don't let these moments of inspiration be fleeting and short-lived. Paint your masterpiece. Do something soon. As I mentioned, you have opportunities all around you. Do something. May have an effect on other people in your life. In conclusion, I ask you to imagine for a moment. Imagine that you travel to the heavenly world. But just for a short visit, you're coming right back. And you come up to the heavenly world and you see that there's a beautiful library. Beautiful mahogany bookshelves. Lots of them. Leather bound books. Names on the leather bound books in gold. And you're able to see as you take notice that they're names of people. And that the library is set up in alphabetical order. And soon you discover that every human being has a book of their own with their name. So you race through the library to find the shelf that has the letter that your name starts with. And you find that section. And then you look for the bookcase that would have the book that bears your name. And you find it. There's a book in heaven that has your name. You take the book off the shelf and you start reading. It's the story of your life. It tells of the triumphs, it tells of the struggles, it tells of every day's experience, it tells of the joys, and it tells of the sorrows, it tells the highs and it tells the lows. You read on. It's told so poignantly and so accurately. You get to the end of the written pages. And it brings you to this day. 
Monday, December 12th, 2011. You're sitting in the Chabad Center on Canwood Street. The book stops, but it's not over because there are many blank pages left to fill in. Now it's when you first begin. Go complete the story and make it a masterpiece. Thank you very much.